This is the story of Air France Flight 2005. On the 12th of September 1961, an Air France sued Caravelle was on its way from Orly Airport in Paris to Casablanca in Morocco, with a stopover at Rabat in Morocco. The sued Caravelle was one of those planes that looks retro and futuristic at the same time. In addition to all of that, it was one of the most innovative planes in the air. The plane departed Paris at 6.26 p.m. and the flight was normal, but they'd have a challenging time getting down to Rabat as there was a low-lying layer of fog that obscured the airport. There was a two-knot wind coming in from the north and visibility was at 500 meters or 1,600 feet and the fog hugged the ground at an altitude of about 300 meters or 1,000 feet. The airport did not have ILS, which complicated matters further. The crew were in contact with an airline operations agent on the ground at Rabat. They talked about the possibility of continuing on to Casablanca or diverting to Tangiers. The weather at Tangiers was a lot better. At 8.46 p.m., the crew were in touch with Casablanca Regional Center, and they were getting weather data for both Rabat and Tangiers from Casablanca Regional Center so that they could compare the situation on the ground. Visibility on the ground at Rabat was changing very quickly. Patches of fog rolled over the airport, and visibility varied between 500 meters and a kilometer, or 1,600 feet to 3,200 feet. At 8.55 p.m., the crew got a transmission from their guy on the ground. He said that the weather was clearing up. ATC told the crew that they expected the weather to hold for the time being. As the plane flew over the airport of Port Liaud, the pilot asked the controller if the controller could see radio pylons some 15 kilometers or 10 miles away. The controller replied that he could not, but he added that the runway was clear. As the plane overflew the town of Rabat, the controller told the crew that the conditions at the airport had worsened. His transmission was not based on empirical data, but he was right. The fog bank now hugged the ground at 100 feet. The pilot in command radioed that they'd be making an approach to runway 04 using a navigational beacon called Kilo Juliet. The air traffic controller warned the pilot about the beacon, Kilo Juliet, was not aligned with the runway and was offset to its side, but this warning was never acknowledged. The aircraft, unknown to the controller, had crashed 8.4 kilometers or 5 miles short of the runway. The crash site was to the left of the extended center line. The aircraft was in ruins and none of the 77 people on board survived. The aircraft at the time of the impact was in a slight left bank and the marks on the ground suggested that the plane touched down once, bounced over a gorge, and then came down hard on the other side. The investigators had the burnt out wreckage to study and they tried to glean all that they could from it. They inspected the engines. They deemed that the engines were at a low power setting at the time of impact. Both of them were working up until the last moment. The elevators and the ailerons of the plane were practically intact as well, and so were the servo motors that drove them. They decided to test them to see if they worked, and the whole thing worked as intended. Now, let's look at the flight path of the plane to see if that tells us something. Now for a few disclaimers. The source material was just a bunch of text. Like, there's no map included, and so my map is based on that, but it's just an approximation. The position of the landmarks in the report may have changed a bit over the last 59 years since this accident. The map's just there to bring clarity and nothing more. First, the plane followed the coast from Kenarita to Rabat. It flew over the KJ Beacon, which was 800 meters or 2600 feet to the west of the airport. The plane then did an orbit over the town of Saleh and then proceeded to fly over the town of Rabat. Once at Rabat, it started a left 180 degree turn to line up with the runway at the airport. This was pretty standard stuff and did not seem off. It's not what a plane in distress would do. From the map, it looked like a normal landing. The wreck backed up the notion of a normal landing. The gear was down, flaps was set to 10. Even though the FDR did not record engine parameters, physical examinations concluded that the engine was idling. So. What brought down Air France Flight 2005? It was not an in-flight structural failure. There was no mayday call and the plane was under control right up to the last moment. There were no control issues. Again, no mayday call and the plane's bank and rate of descent 
was very uniform and did not indicate a control issue. The engines checked out as well, no issue there. Another thing that they considered were the altimeter settings that they used to calculate their altitude. The correct altimeter setting was 1005. The altimeter uses this value to calculate the altitude of the airplane. If you calibrate your altimeter incorrectly, it's going to show you the wrong altitude and that can cause an accident. But when they looked at the altimeters recovered from the wreck, it showed that they were set to 1005. So that's not the cause. Like I said, when looking at the flight path of the plane, all looks normal, except for their altitude. They were 1000 feet below where they were supposed to be. Had they had an extra 1000 feet in altitude, they would have ended up in the vicinity of the airport. So the investigators settled on the crew misreading the altimeter as the probable cause of the accident. They thought they were 1000 feet higher than they actually were. The mistake was probably made at the start of the descent and then they just carried that error with them through their approach. Now that's where the official documentation ends. Would I have liked for it to have more information? Yes, but I'm glad that we got at least a little bit of official documentation for a crash that happened almost 60 years ago. In my opinion, the weather probably threw them off. The fog was thick and as they straightened out of their left bank, their attention was probably focused outside. They might have been looking for the airport and they just did not notice their altitude. They were using an analog altimeter and not a digital one like the ones we have today and so you can't just glance at it to see what your altitude is. While researching this crash, I came across another sued Caravel crash that took place in 1960. An SAS sued Caravel was established on the localizer for a runway and it ended up striking a hill crashing short of the runway. They too were 1,100 feet below their glide slope. I don't know if that's just a weird coincidence or if that's indicative of a design flaw of the sued Caravel. The similarities don't just stop there. As with Air France Flight 2005, the SAS investigation had to guess about the cause of the crash because everything else checked out. They too had hypothesized that the captain had misread the altimeter. The cockpit of the SAS sued Caravel had four altimeters. Three of those altimeters had three indicators while the other one only had two. The investigation concluded that the captain had just gotten confused and flew the plane 1000 feet below where they were supposed to be. Without GPWS in the early caravels, the crew was never notified of their impending disaster. So what do you think happened? If you're a pilot, have you ever faced an issue reading altimeters? I'd love to know. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.